My journey as a Superman fan started with a tattered red cape blowing in the wind. That ending rocketed me forward like a red-blue blur through a decade-long origin story and poignant tales of self-discovery and now fatherhood and backward to the character's very beginnings. Now, on this podcast, we journey together across time and media to examine the stories that have defined the Man of Steel. Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss the Adventures of Superman run by writer Greg Rucka is returning guest Scott Honig. Scott, welcome back. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Really, really excited to talk about these comics. Yes, and this is our last episode of 2022. Can you believe it? Astonishing. Astonishing. (laughs) I want to thank you and all of the guests who have joined me on these episodes on the various series that I do all year. This was a huge year for Flat Squirrel podcasts and this podcast in particular. We went weekly, so we did more episodes than ever before. I launched my Power Rangers show. I launched my Adventures of Superman show. I launched the Digging for Justice Patreon show where we look at DC movies. It was a huge year. I cannot stress how much fun it's been from from my perspective. I've loved, loved having these conversations. And so I really want to thank you and all the guests who have come on board. I say this all the time, but I, I mean it sincerely that this would not work if the guests didn't come in having done the homework and coming in with such enthusiasm and insight and passion. Like it just, it makes it, it makes these, you know, sometimes two hour long episodes just fly by for, again, for me, at least hopefully others feel the same. <laughs> Listen, for as much fun as you are clearly having for anybody who's ever listened to even a single episode, that's, that's obvious. I'm going to, I'm going to speak on behalf of, of all the guests and all your listeners and say that uh, if you are having half as much fun as we all are participating in it and listening to it, then, uh, you know, then that's a success. It's just been an, an amazing year for this podcast and I'm so happy and, and honored to be even a small part of it. So thank you for what you do and, and for putting just positivity and goodness out into the world. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I'll just say this quickly, but I'm, I'm very proud of, of all of the episodes, you know, the one-offs that we do, I, I always enjoy and there's a place for them. I, I'm also proud of the events that, that we had because a lot, I mean, a lot of time and planning goes into to everything, but especially when we build out these multi-episode arcs, like the Superman animated series mixtapes or the Donnerverse or Death to Wedding or our Superman reimagined event. And I love, I mean, I have so much fun mapping all of that out and it takes time, but I, I so love doing it. And, you know, to, you know, to hear the feedback that we've gotten has been tremendous. And so on that note, again, audience, thank you. Really, uh, I, I cannot, I cannot tell you from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate whether you've listened to all of the episodes or some of the episodes or one episode, whatever the case may be, maybe this is your first episode. I don't know, but mm-hmm. whatever the case, I really, really appreciate it. And especially to those who, you know, who have reached out, whether it's publicly or privately left a review, sent a comment, a tweet, all of that is, is noticed and appreciated. So I thank you very much. So again, this is our last episode of 2022. We're going to take a few weeks off for the holidays and have a little rest, a little recharge. I think this is a great opportunity if you've missed any episodes or maybe if you haven't checked out Summoning the Zords or another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman, this is a great time to sample those shows, catch up on any Digging for Kryptonite episodes you may have missed, maybe sign up for the Patreon, check out all the bonus episodes there, and we will be back with our first episode of 2023 on January 10th. So I'll say my final you know, holiday wishes at the end, but... That's uh, that's what the next few weeks uh, and our return will look like. Amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, really. I, I'll echo what Anthony says. Please do yourselves a favor and fill in the gaps for yourselves of the episodes that you've missed in the same way that Anthony is using this podcast to fill in his gaps in his Superman fandom. It's to listen to the entire sequence of episodes is to get such a broad view of Superman as a character, as a cultural icon. Um, it's incredibly enlightening. I've shared the podcast episodes with both friends of mine who are fans of comics and the character in particular. I've also shared it with people who really have no experience with comics and very little knowledge of Superman. And uh, every one of them uh, has said just what an incredible job you do as the host of the show and uh, what, uh, you know, 
the, your insight in choosing your guests and how you choose to ask questions. And they're always intrigued by the conversations and they always come away feeling like they learned something about this icon that they didn't know before. Wow. Well, that's so nice. I appreciate that. I feel like, I feel like we should just stop here. We should call it an episode. I feel like we can, (laughs) (laughs) I don't screw it up now. No, that's very nice. I appreciate it. All right. So let's get into our final episode of 2022, the Greg Rucka run on adventures of Superman in my mind. Well, talking about selecting guests, you know, there are certain topics that I have certain guests earmarked for and, and you are, you're like my Rucka guy. When, when I think about it, yeah, you are now. I mean, you know, we did an episode of another podcast that I did. I did a 12 episode run of a show called My Comic Shop Book Club in 2021. And you joined me for a couple of episodes on that, including an episode on the Rucka Detective run, which I believe was that was the first time that you had read that. It was. Yeah. Now, as far as this adventures run goes, had you read this at the time? I had. Yeah. So my experience with it at the time uh, was that I, I become a regular Superman reader in the year 2000 when Lex Luthor was elected president because I was just so intrigued by that. Um, and then I started reading all the Superman titles monthly. So this this takes place about four, five years or so after that. So I've been reading Superman leading up to this. I did not know who Greg Rucka was as a writer at that point because he hadn't really become, you know, Greg Rucka, the 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 iconic writer that he is today. Um, So the name didn't mean anything to me. I just was reading Adventures of Superman because I like Superman. Um, I will say that I dropped the title about five issues in at the time. Oh, really? Yeah, this ended up being a jumping off point uh, for me. At the time, I wasn't I wasn't vibing on the Superman in a police procedural kind of move. And now, of course, we know that Rucka, that's where Rucka's wheelhouse is, right? He does this, whether it's Gotham Central, whether it's uh, his Lois Lane, but like he really leans into the police procedural. He's really good at it. But at the time, I just wasn't feeling it. So I actually hopped off. So for part of this, this is the first time I was experiencing. So I got to read the whole thing all the way through and thank you for that opportunity. Oh, okay. That's fascinating. So this will sort of piggyback a little bit off of last week's episode where we talked about the Joe Casey run on adventures. Now I referred to that run as a forgotten period in the adventures of Superman title largely because Casey's stuff, except for issues that were part of crossovers, was never collected and is almost entirely absent from the DC app and is not otherwise available to purchase digitally. The Rucka run, I'm not going to go so far as to call it forgotten, but let's say overlooked. And I think that's fair because I think when you look at Rucka's DC bibliography, I feel like people would more more readily gravitate towards his Batman work and probably his Wonder Woman run as well and these issues are once again sadly frustratingly i'm not going to harp on this but they are almost totally mia from the app except for issues that were part of the sacrifice storyline i believe but otherwise it's totally mia it was collected i'll give dc this it was collected in three trade paperbacks unconventional warfare that healing touch and ruin revealed they're all currently out of print yeah. So, so I think this is a run that more pe- I'm sure more people are familiar with this than were with the Casey run, but I think there's probably a decent number of, of you know, DC or Superman fans who have, have never read this, you know, even if they're aware of it. So it was fascinating to revisit now. And just like with the Casey issues, I read these when they came out. I owned them. I sold them. In this case, I also had the trade paperbacks and sold the trade paperbacks and then had to resort to eBay and rebuy issues that I've owned multiple times previously so that I could prepare for this episode. But I'm happy to say that it was worth it because I had a really great time and we'll talk about all of it. And just so people know exactly what issues we're talking about, uh, Rucka did uh, like these backup stories in Adventures, I think it was 625 and 626. It was right before the full run started. So he did these short backup stories during the Godfall storyline, which (laughs) is funny. When I covered Godfall on the podcast like a year ago with Ken, I, I think I, I talked about how, you know, the issues were short. I was like, I don't know what else was going on at the time. And I didn't have the context for it you know, as I had forgotten. 
Uh, so now at least I was able to sort of uh, solve that piece for myself. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so 625 and 626, these six page uh, backup stories. And then the proper run uh, essentially is 627 through uh, 648. Um, and we read most of those. We skipped. There was there was an issue that Judd Winnick wrote that was part of a Superman Shazam storyline. We skipped that. Uh, we skipped Rucka's final issue, which was a big Infinite Crisis tie-in. And we also skipped a couple of issues that were part of the Sacrifice storyline. Yeah. But don't worry, people, because Scott and I have plans for that Sacrifice storyline. In fact, that ties into a larger event. Going back to this idea of these events that I like to plan. We got a big event coming next year. I have a lot to map out, but we're going to be spending a good bit of time in this in this infinite crisis era. So, we're going to get to that. But so we read essentially with the with the exception of those few things that I just mentioned, those crossovers or, or fill-ins, uh we read the uh the entire Rucka run, which crazy enough, I, I tallied up the number of issues that were assigned for those 18. So a relatively for me, that's a relatively small reading assignment. Yeah, normally when you come on the show, I'm like, hey, can you do these 50 issues? Thanks. <laughs> 18, 18 was a breeze. <laughs> I, you know, it's so funny because, you know, you, you did three chapters of our, our Crisis Till Death event last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, we acknowledged it on and off mic at the time about how many issues it was. But I think it's only with the passage of time and looking back that I'm like, man, I really like dumped a lot on this guy and I feel bad, but you, I, I like, I think you enjoyed it and you did such a great job and it was so fun. So hopefully it was worth it <laughs> from your perspective. It certainly was from mine. <laughs> I love it every time. Give me, keep, keep giving it to me. I'll take it. So, uh, you know, a lot to unpack with this. Cause it's funny. I was saying to myself, you know, only 18 issues. I don't know if we'll hit a two hour episode here, but <laughs> then as I'm thinking about it, there's a lot going on in the run itself. And it's also interesting, I think, to think about where where this fell, right, in the Superman titles at the time, All right? So as we've talked about before, the, the famous triangle era, the triangle numbering, that went away very shortly after our Worlds at War. And the four Superman titles, you know, sort of continued on their own tracks thereafter until until infinite crisis with the occasional crossover like ending battle or something like that right the man of steel title that mark schultz was writing that got canceled about a year after our world's at war so we're down to three titles on the superman title you know wrote Loeb sticks around for a little bit before he leaves to go do superman batman and after he leaves we have i think a very forgotten run by steven siegel and scott mcdaniel that also uncollected and not on the app and probably available on eBay. I, I don't hold your breath for an episode on that. I, I don't, yeah. uh, I don't know that I'm going to get back into that, but that introduced another version of Supergirl. I don't know if you remember that, that arc. I, very vaguely. I do. Yeah. Gotcha. And then after that, we had Azarello and Lee on uh, Superman for tomorrow. And then I believe right after that, we segued into a, a pretty short run by Mark Verheiden that took us right into infinite crisis. Yeah. Again, I don't suspect that I'll cover that, and I have covered for tomorrow before. On action, you know, Joe Kelly stuck around for a good long while, and we did a big episode on that, uh, our last episode last year. After Kelly, we had Chuck Austin. Remember Chuck Austin? I sure do. I remember that run. I read it, and there was a it was a, a new Ivan Rice on on a lot of the art for that run too. Great art, beautiful great art. art. That's no wonder he became a superstar. Yeah. The art is great. That's about all I have to yep. say about that run. And after that, a very short run by Gail Simone and John Byrne. I've had yeah. at least, I've had at least one listener <clears throat> request an episode on that. And I, I hate to, to break hearts here, but I, I, I don't know. I, the, the, as much as I enjoyed Byrne's work, you know, back in the eighties on Superman, that run at that point in time didn't really do it for me. So I probably wouldn't revisit that. No, and it even felt a little transitional. You know, it, it felt like they sort of wrapped up a big movement in the titles and then were building toward something. Although I don't know that I necessarily felt what they were building toward. Now I now I know because, we, you know, we have hindsight. Um, but it just felt like it was kind of, you know, spinning its wheels a bit until we got to the next big thing. Yeah, for, for sure. And... And on adventures, we had Casey, which we talked about last week, and then Rucka. And so all those those runs that I just mm -hmm. talked about across the you know three titles at the time, I mean, that took us right up to Infinite Crisis. And it's not like, oh, everything was totally different after that, but it was definitely a different vibe and you had different creators and we were down to the two titles. It was, 
I mean, I think you can really make an argument. We already had an era end before Infinite Crisis, but certainly past that point. And, you know, then a few years after that, we had New 52 and and so on, which actually right. brings up a, a, one of our patron questions. So patrons at a certain level can ask a question or make a comment and be read on the episode. So I have a shout out to our patron, Brian. Uh, I, I had I had posed this. I had listed the, the Joe Casey and Greg Rucker runs together. So I'm not sure... Uh, which this more specifically applies to, but I didn't read it in the last episode, so I'll I'll pose it now and we'll see uh, how we want to unpack it. But uh, Brian said, I had really high expectations for this run. Um, It was fine. I feel like this was the real beginning of the end of Superman's ongoing narrative. The triangles had been gone for a bit, like you and I just said, Mm -hmm. but this is where I feel the stories stopped flowing into one another smoothly. Since this run, Superman gets more of a rotating door of creators and each creative team seems to be putting their mark on Superman. I have not read these since they came out, but I remember this as where we start losing the historical supporting cast. I mean, I would say yes and no on that part because there's Rucka pulls in a lot in these in this in this final run here, which was amazing and one of the reasons why I like this so much. And uh, Brian says Carlin's editorial leadership will never be matched. Fair point. I don't disagree there. <laughs> he says, "Don't get me wrong. I've enjoyed most of the runs, but the feel of the Triangle era is truly missed. What expectations did you have going in?" I assume this was a reread for you. How do these runs hold up compared to what came before? And knowing what comes after, where do these land for future rereads? Good question. So let me, especially the piece about, you know, I know, again, you had dropped this at the time. So let me, we'll start there with you. So reading this Rucka run on Adventures Now, I mean, what were the overall impressions? And is this something that would warrant a future reread from you, absent being assigned to read it for a podcast? Yeah. So what, what Brian reminded me of in that, in that great question is that um, in this particular era, just a little bit leading into it and then certainly leading out to it, we, we break from the multiple Superman titles all basically tying into each other, right? The, the, the hallmark of the triangle era. And then and the, the reason why the triangles were necessary is because all four titles would continue one into the next. So you had an ongoing story every week of every month. And then in this era, you started to have individual creative teams on the books, but they're doing their own things. They're not coordinating with the other creators. So when we're looking at Rucka's Adventures of Superman, it is Rucka's Adventures of Superman. It has nothing to do with what Azarello and Lee were doing with, with, for tomorrow, it had nothing to do with uh, whatever's going on in action comics. They, they, those three books, because as you mentioned, Man of Steel was dropped, were really their own, they had their own trajectories. And so what's nice about that is it gave creative teams the freedom to tell their own stories in the style that best suited them. On the other hand, it renders titles unnecessary if it's not your particular flavor. Um, I know you and I, when we we talked about Triangle Era, you know, some of the more supernatural elements of of one book versus another wasn't really our bag, but we still read those books because that was part three of the month that we needed to get in order to bridge part two and part four. Here, I just didn't feel... I just didn't feel the connection to the other books. So uh, for me, like Azarello and Lee on, on Superman was my bread and butter. And then this just, I uh, just didn't feel like I, like it was compensatory reading. I think that's fair. And what's, what's especially weird about this time in, in retrospect is that we would never again Yeah, we would never again have that many titles, regardless of whether they're connected or not. So, again, even going back to immediately post our world, there were four titles doing their own thing. And then you move ahead a little bit and you've got three. And and yeah, I mean, they really were doing their own thing. I mean, Azarello and Lee were one year ahead in the timeline dealing with 5% of the world's population having vanished. And I mean, Chuck Austin over on action was playing around with a Clark Lois Lana love triangle. He was throwing in Gog. It's like, I, you know, so, <laughs> again, I don't remember that run fondly. So, you know, you definitely had them doing their own thing. And so I think, yeah, that cuts both ways. I think it allows you to have to have something like a Greg Rucka run. Yeah. You can't really say, you know, you go back to the triangle era as much as, yeah, there were definitely creators who seemed to be leading the charge, but you can't. 
you know, you can't give someone a collection of like Dan Jurgens issues and say, hey, here's a complete story. Whereas you can give someone, if you can track down those out of print trades, you can give them those three ruck of trades. And it's like, hey, you get a complete story. Yep. With the one caveat being then towards the end, and this was where I was starting to feel a little bit of frustration. It got, I felt like it was starting to get bogged down by a lot of the infinite crisis lead up stuff. Uh, and I wish it had been left more to its own devices. However, you can still give them those ruck issues. It really feels like a run. Yeah, it was it was the the tie-ins to the big event coupled with sharing the writing duties with a pair of other writers, right? Uh, Geo De Philippus and Christina Weir ended up coming on to do. Uh, the breakdown of the responsibilities wasn't clear, but my guess is the plot was generally Rucka's and they were scripting it. Yeah, I mean, that happened a couple of times towards the end, including the final issue we read. Yeah. The resolution yeah. to this ruined storyline. I That... And look, they did a great job, and I I do feel like they captured. I, I don't know exactly what the dynamic is like among them as 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 creators, but I definitely got the sense that they were simpatico, and it definitely felt like they executed his vision. So, but at the same time, it's like you know, you would love to see the writer who's been writing the book for <laughs> almost twenty issues be able to really bring it home. But I think Rucka was probably being pulled in a lot of different directions. And kind of on that note, another thing that's notable about about this run and this and this period of time because I remember this was a big deal when this was happening that I think this was the first time or or one of the only times where a single writer was simultaneously writing the monthly adventures of Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman because he was doing Detective Comics, right. Adventures of Superman and the Wonder Woman title. So it was a big deal that he was writing the Trinity in their respective monthly titles at the same time. He was juggling a lot. That is interesting. I didn't realize that they all coincided like that, but yeah, I think you're right. That's fascinating. And yeah. for, for a writer who at that point wasn't, you know, the superstar that he would later become like, that's like good for him for <laughs> doing something so right that DC gave him the keys to those three franchises. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, obviously you and I talked about the detective run. Have you read his Wonder Woman? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Did you read his, his latter run when he came back for rebirth? I sure did. Did that hold up for you? Cause he lost me on that one. I loved it so much. I wish I I did. The structure of it was a little bit difficult only because they were alternating months. So he had two art teams. He had Nicholas Scott and then he had Liam Sharp. And they were telling essentially two different stories, one in the past, one in the present. And when you were reading the issues in order, you were you were basically getting one story, but it would all it would skip a month, right? So you'd have the Nicholas Scott months like one, three, five, seven, and you'd have Liam Sharp on the, the other ones. When they collected them in trade, though, they collected each artist's contribution separately. So you'd get issues one, three, five, seven, nine, for instance, and so you were able to read it much more smoothly than if you were collecting it monthly. And at that point, I had already switched over to trades, and it was a much better experience. Um, and at that point, it was you know, Rucka was Rucka, and I was I was all over, all over it. I loved it. All right, maybe I'll have to give it another shot because I loved his first run of the early to mid two thousands. It's it's my favorite Wonder Woman run. There's nothing that I've wow. read that's topped it. So I was heartbroken when I came back uh, for his subsequent run during Rebirth, and it just, it did not do it for me. But I do remember the split narrative, and I'm sure it would read better the way it's collected. So I'd be open to revisiting For sure. But if you ever do, you know who to call to talk about. Yes. (laughs) But, you know, that's a long way of saying that. Uh, Again, with the exception of that latter Wonder Woman run, Mm -hmm. I'm a big Rucka fan. And, I mean, I remain to this day, but especially at the time, I was really following everything he was doing. He really came on my radar, I think, and it was similar for a lot of comics readers with his work towards the end of Batman No Man's Land. And then, of course, he mm-hmm. uh, you know, stayed on, on on Detective Comics. And we'll, we'll get here when we get to the end of the Adventures of Superman run. But for those who did read all three of those runs, you get some really interesting intersections with the Sasha hmm. character from his Detective run and the Jonah McCarthy character from his Wonder Woman run. It all sort of ties in here now if you've not read any of that i think it maybe falls a little flat but i think if you were following everything uh it, you know it would it maybe make you smile because at least you see how it all how it all collides and how his three runs had that intersection point point. and then like like i said there's a lot of business to do with infinite crisis so 
that kind of cut both ways for me. Like I said, I, I felt like it got a little bit bogged down with that. But at the same time, I thought I did think there were some interesting ideas that they pulled in that worked. And it's also, you know, for better or worse, it, it brings you back to a specific, and it man, it was a moment in time in the DC universe in that lead up to Infinite Crisis. And, yeah. to, you know, your mileage on this will vary whether you liked it or not, but th there's something <clears throat> about it, I guess, that the pull of nostalgia where regardless of what ultimate disappointments I may have had with respect to Infinite Crisis, I will never forget the excitement that I felt and we'll talk about this next year when we get to our big event. But, you know, I'll mm -hmm. never forget the excitement that I felt in the lead up to that. And on that day that that first issue came out, I remember I skipped class. I was a freshman <laughs> in college. I remember skipped class. I went to the comic shop where I worked and I worked that day so I could unpack the shipment and get my hands on that book. So there's a lot of that wrapped up in it for me. And so reading these issues, even though it's like, man, this really dates it and, and ties it to a specific moment in the DCU, uh, I, I found that I welcomed it more than not. Greg Rucka for me is one of those writers who more than a lot of others is able to take an, let's say an editorially mandated tie-in issue and do something with it. Right. As opposed to feel like feeling like, you know, you're being saddled with, well, now I got to interrupt the flow of my, my story to, to deal with this. He was able to, I mean, in this run, we saw a tie-in issue to identity crisis and then these, infinite crisis sort of tie-ins. And, and in all cases, it doesn't feel nearly as clunky as it probably could have or should have, given, you know, clearly what he was trying to build in his own independent run. Um, I, I don't envy him the fact that clearly it was an interruption, but I think he made the most of it. And I'm sure we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more later. Yeah, totally. No, I agree. I, yeah, I mean, let me say, I really, really enjoyed my reread of this run so much so that I'm like, idiot, why did you, why did you sell this stuff twice over in the past? It was, it was, it was very strange. I enjoyed a lot of it for, for a variety of reasons uh, in particular. And I was, you know, touching on this before the fact that Rucka did pull in characters, you know, and some only, you know, got a little play and others factored in very prominently, but characters we hadn't seen in a long time lucy lane ron troop their baby sam i mean my mm -hmm. god i think it had been years since we had seen them pete ross and lana lang and and of course emil hamilton who we'll get to who factors in very prominently yes he does and and i think so i was i was pleasantly surprised to be reminded of have all those characters who who, who kind of came back but also you know, to Brian's point and, and along the lines of what we've been saying, this really was the end of an era. And there was something very fitting and very satisfying about having a lot of these callbacks to the Triangle era. As this, I mean, this was, the, you know, I don't know, I, I guess it depends how you want to define it. I mean, the, the I guess you could say this was the end of the post-crisis era because now we have another crisis. In my mind, I still kind of look as the at the post-crisis Superman as up to the New 52. Yeah, I do too. Um, but again, there was still a line of demarcation here. And so it really felt, it felt appropriate to, you know, for all of these uh, instances where characters and, and, and storylines from the Triangle era came back. There's a very specific reference to Toy Man's killing of Cat yeah. Grant's son. And I don't know how long it had been since that had been referenced. It's probably about 12 years, I want to say, 12 years in real time. Yeah. And again, I mean, a long and, time. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really remember that, you know, when we covered the Superman, the, uh, the doomsday wars, uh, during the death to wedding event that came out in the late nineties and that did, that did reference it, but that wasn't even in the regular books. I mean, that was a side miniseries. So, you know, there were a lot of things like that that I had <clears> forgotten where it's like, oh, this really, this really means something as someone who has so much invested in that triangle era. And then I think it was overall a, a compelling story. And just to tie back to the last week's episode for a second, what Perry and I talked about there was how, you know, Joe Casey's run, and I know we were talking about this off mic, you read it at the time, mm -hmm. but didn't really remember it super specifically, which again, I, I had a similar, <laughs> similar experience myself until I did my reread, but those were, all of Casey's stories were, were one, two or three part stories. They were very short. And while there were definitely themes that built throughout the run, it, you know, it, there wasn't necessarily a singular narrative 
that we were following across his couple of years on the title, the way that we do here with Rucka and the story of Lois's shooting overseas mm-hmm. when she's covering the war and this new villain, this new adversary, Ruin, who is targeting Superman and those close to him, those two threads, as well as the new leader of the SCU, Lupe, carry from the from the first issue all the way to the end. And so that's why, again, when I say this really has the, the, the hallmarks of a true run, mm-hmm. that's kind of what I'm thinking of. Oh, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, there's, he's, he's one of those writers who will plant seeds early on, but he clearly knows what he's doing enough to make sure that those seeds grow and that he pays them off, you know, given the opportunity to, which he, he was here, uh, given the opportunity, he will pay them off. And I, and I really like that. I also, like you, really enjoyed a lot of the characters who return from earlier uh, eras who we hadn't seen in a while, who hadn't gotten a lot of attention. The ones you named primarily. Um, my one of the minor frustrations, and I'll say it's a minor frustration, is that while we're trying to bring the, them back, he's also introducing a lot of new elements, which I applaud him for in isolation. Right? He, he, if he's going to make his mark on the title, of course he wants to add to the mythology. Lupe is is probably the most notable addition here. I think she's a great character. I really enjoy her voice, her presence. Um, but introducing a character means that you now have to develop them in ways that the characters with longstanding histories, you, you just have to sort of catch us up with them. You don't need, you don't need the, the initial development. Um, and so it just felt like there was a lot between Lupe, between the Alston twins, um, who become this sort of new version of Parasite, who, by the way, I didn't, I did not know because I had stopped reading before their introduction the first time around. And then now having watched Superman and Lois, the character of Allie Alston is clearly based on this, even though they're, they're quite different in their iterations, but the, the, they, it's obviously the same character. And and I found that really interesting because I love the show, but um Ruin is the big bad of the of the run, but he also has these two sort of I don't say henchmen, but there's there's uh, uh, Zlim. I don't even know how you X L I M. I assume it's uh, Zlim, and then there was uh, 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 Replicon. Replicon, Replicon, and for me, those three, I just kept getting them all mixed up in my head i I, they looked kind of similar their power sets were kind of similar ruin stood out because he clearly emerged as the the big bad and of course the reveal of his true identity both times was pretty shocking um but the other two i just felt kind of got lost in the in the mix a bit as the the new parasite twins kind of did and then there's lupe but then there was another uh, there was another female character who's sort of sometimes on the page looked similar. And I, I just uh, Jerry, kind of, the other Jerry. Reporter. Yep. And I kept kind of getting things a little bit mixed up because there was a lot going on at the same time. Okay. I got gotcha. you. All right. I want to, I want to unpack this. Let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. You got it. This episode made possible by educator, hobby, comic book collector, and pop culture enthusiast, Sam Lim. Sam is moving to the South Jersey area and looking to connect with other comics fans as well as retailers. They are also looking for their new local comic shop, so recommendations are welcome. Be sure to follow Sam on Instagram at SZL Comics. Acme Comics is a locally owned and operated full-service comic book store in Greensboro, North Carolina for people of all ages and walks of life. Since 1983, this nine-time Eisner Award nominee uses their collective knowledge and resources to connect you with the best material available. They pride themselves on their significant contemporary and vintage back-issue selection. Mail order subscriptions to new releases are available, and all offerings are available to anyone, anywhere, via mail order. Follow Acme on social media and eBay, listen to the Acme cast on all podcast services, and visit acmecomics.com for much more. Film lovers and filmmakers, should check out this family of film festivals, Brightside Tavern in Jersey City, Hang On to Your Shorts in Asbury Park, Point Lookout on Long Island, and In the Cut in Bloomfield, New Jersey. 
I was fortunate enough to have my work shown at these festivals, and I found them to be very enjoyable and well-run events. Submission information for filmmakers, as well as details about the festivals generally, can be found at filmfreeway.com. Follow the festivals on social media for news and updates about events, discounts, tickets, and more. Also, be sure to listen to the Hang On To Your Shorts and Cullen On Film podcasts available via a shared universe network. Fat Moose Comics is New Jersey's best and oldest comic book store. Established in 1982 and currently under new ownership, Moose sells a wide selection of new and old comics from every publisher, action figures, graphic novels, posters, statues, and more. If you're looking for something and they don't have it, they can probably get it for you. They know a guy. Visit Fat Moose in Whippany the next time you're in the Garden State, and be sure to reach out via the Fat Moose Comics Facebook page. Flat Squirrel Productions is an affiliate of BCW Supplies. The next time you need to restock on comic book bags, boards, boxes, and more, be sure to use promo code FSP, that's FSP for Flat Squirrel Productions, to save 10% on your order, and it helps support the show. Thank you. Oh Yeah Comics celebrates and promotes everything that is wonderful about comics, toys, artwork, and the joy they bring to people. Visit them in person at one of their three locations, Harrison, New York, which happens to be my local comic shop, Skokie, Illinois, or Muncie, Indiana. If you have children and have been looking for a family-friendly store, look no further. Join Oh Yeah for exciting events, including creator signings, how-tos, and more. Visit awyeahcomics.com and follow Oh Yeah on social media for more. Their name says exactly how they feel about it. Oh yeah. And we're back. Okay, so it's really interesting to get your your takes on everything and and you know, your your points are all well taken. So first with the res- with respect to the Superman and Lois of it all. So yes, like you said, so the season 2 of the CW show utilized the Allie Alston version of Parasite. And I watched season 2 of Superman and Lois well before I did my reread of of this Rucka run. Side note, I finished my reading uh, for, for this episode <laughs> literally like five minutes before we sat down to record. <laughs> I, I really rode the lightning on this one. It came down to the wire. But it's it's so fresh. See, that's the benefit of, of reading it so close to recording time. Anyway, so when I was watching Superman and Lois, I was not making the connection. And there's a point, because they introduced Allie Alston and she's this essentially cult leader, right, who sucked yeah. Lucy Lane into it. If anyone hasn't watched season two yet, it's it's great. I love the show. I encourage you to watch it. We'll have an episode on it uh, before season three starts. So it took a while, I guess, for me to realize that she was meant to be a parasite character. I know Lois refers to her as such um, mm-hmm. relatively early on in the season, but I still wasn't totally making the connection. I think it was probably on social media where I saw people saying, hey, there's this other version of parasite from the comics. And again, I mean, I'm, it has been decade almost you know well well over a decade since i read this run initially so i was not making the connection to this that was actually one of the one of the things that sort of planted the bug in my head of like oh i should go back and read the ruckus stuff now having just seen ali alston parasite on superman and lois yeah wildly different uh, other than the name they really have nothing in common i mean the ali alston of the comic is is just very young and brash and, and immature she has a twin brother uh, who doesn't make it out of the run. No. I don't know to what extent, if any, that version of Parasite has been utilized in the comics since. I don't know. But again, having just watched Superman and Lois, it was cool to see the comic book origin, even though they're very different, but to see the Allie Austin Parasite of the comics. As as far as the other characters and, and you know, sort of the, the challenge, you know, if you introduce these characters, like you said, then you have to spend the time to develop them. I do get what you're saying, I, you know, with respect to Lupe, for example, the the new head of the SCU. Uh, you know, w- one of the features of of her character, she's, uh, you know, she's constantly throwing herself at Superman, which is definitely a departure from Maggie Sawyer, right? Who was famously a lesbian character, and so you know that was a component, that was a dynamic that was not there at all. So I kind of appreciate the instinct of like, okay, like we're gonna you know introduce new female head of the SCU. There's going to be this other component there. I feel like you can only get so much mileage out of that. I mean, and they really, I, I don't know, like they really went for it because there's the you know that whole scene where um, you know Superman goes to her place to talk to her and she's in the bathtub and like she calls him in and he's so uncomfortable and I, I you know. 
again, your mileage on that may vary, but uh, you know, there's that. And then we certainly see that she is, uh, you know, not afraid to, to break the rules, right. When she is going after ruin. Um, but she ultimately has a heroic moment of redemption towards the end of, of the run. Uh, and that's another character. I don't know that she's been utilized outside of this, except she did make an appearance in for tomorrow. Oh, so the priest, Father Daniel, I believe is his name. In the first issue, they're talking and they allude to a romantic past before he took his his orders. Um, so in any event, there was at least at the time, because we were saying like the books were really doing their own things. They really were. But that was one instance where Lupe did make that uh, appearance in, in the other book. Um, but so I, I like I, I do, I, you know, I do get what you're saying for, with that. Yeah, it's been a while since I've read for tomorrow I, th- I don't think i've reread it since it originally came out so that that connection it was was lost on me although at some point i'm i assume i'll reread it and then i'll probably remember um the the scene that you referenced with lupe in the bathtub and and superman trying to have a conversation with her while she is coming on to him and is naked um originally this on the reread it rubbed me the wrong way um but when I stopped and thought about it, I actually came to appreciate that scene for, for what it did for both characters. For Lupe, I actually appreciate a female character who is so sexually empowered that she comes right out and says exactly what she wants. And it's up to Superman to accept the invitation or not. Um, he doesn't, rightfully so, and, and we fans we know why um what i like about it for superman is as soon as he walks in and notices that she's naked he immediately turns around and never looks back because he he wants to you know give her privacy he doesn't want any sort of impropriety and everything and that's and that's so much in keeping with superman as a character right and he would never want to do anything that's improper both because of his relationship with lois but also you know this is this is you know, a, a citizen in Metropolis, and he would never want to want to cross that line. So I liked actually what it did for for both characters. I did come around. On. Yeah, no, I I, I get that. I, it is it is one of those things with the the past few years that we've lived through, right? And everything that's come to light. You know, you read a scene like this, right, where one character is coming on to another one, and it's not welcomed. Right. And one character is uncomfortable. It just hits differently now. And, you you know, you can't yeah. help but think of, of that. Now, of course, there's not the the power imbalance. He's not a deputy in the SCU. Right. Uh, but, yeah, you, you definitely have that. But, yes, I mean, it does. It does definitely, uh, you know, uh, show you who, you know, <laughs> who they are in, in terms of how they respond to that. So and if the genders were flipped, it would really read differently, too. Yes. You know, if this were a male police officer talking to, let's say, Supergirl and invited her into the bathroom while he was, you know, <laughs> nude in the shower in the bath, this would read very different. Yes. And and even with the genders as they are, I think the the, the part that maybe rubbed me the wrong way was, or at least where I, I, I definitely was like, whoa, okay, is where she says something something to the effect of like, well, I'm going to keep trying. And he's <laughs> like, well, as long as you don't mind me, keep saying no. And, it's, you know, that just that idea of like, well, I'm going to persist even though I know you're not interested in this. Again, yeah. just... In in mm-hmm. the current context and climate, it, climate it just hits a little differently. But yeah, I do like I loved, and I've talked about this. I mean, I loved the supporting cast of the books that we had years prior, and you know Maggie Sawyer and Dan Turpin, you know, they were a big part of that. So I definitely appreciated the attempt to make the SCU a more relevant part of the books in terms of the Superman of it all, but also, and this goes back to something you said before, the setup for this run, at least from the the Clark Kent Daily Planet perspective, is Clark's been demoted and he's on the crime beat and he's, you know, embedded at the shack, the SCU headquarters, right? Uh, And he's there with this other reporter who's, you know, heading towards retirement. So he's kind of on his way out and this is sort of, this is not a plum assignment, right? So it's this older reporter, it's this young uh, woman, Jerry, right? Who's an up and comer, right? She's kind of, you know, cutting her teeth here. And, and Clark. And there's a really interesting moment where, uh, you know, Jerry is displaying some antagonism towards Clark. And he's like, have I have done something to offend you? Like, what's the problem here? And she talks about how, like, I, I always used to read your reporting. Like, your pieces were brilliant. And basically, what are you doing here? Like, you let yourself go yeah. as a reporter in, in so many words. 
And, you know, so like I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And again, I know, I guess this was not, this is one of the reasons why you dropped the book initially. I loved this idea of Clark on the crime beat going on ride alongs with the SCU. I felt that this run didn't go far enough. And mm. I know that, and I don't think that's what DC would be looking for, mm. but essentially what I wanted from this was the Gotham Central equivalent in the Superman books. So mm -hmm. Gotham Central to this, and I'm so long overdue for a reread. It's ridiculous. I have those hardcovers on my shelf. They're staring at me every day. But that remains one of my all-time favorite comic book series. And if anyone hasn't Incredible. read Gotham Central, it's it's great. It's, uh, you know, the the tagline, but it's an accurate one. It's like Law and Order set in the in the DC universe. And Batman is used very sparingly. And that's what I wanted for this run. I wanted it to be Clark going on these ride-alongs and any Superman appearances are, are fleeting. Like he'll only use his powers when he really needs to and we're not really following him for that part of, of the action. Uh, so I, I would have loved more of that. And so we haven't mentioned the artists yet on this run. So the, mm -hmm. almost all of Ruckus' issues were drawn by either Matthew Clark uh, initially, and then later on, Carl Kershaw. And Rags Morales did do a fill-in issue that tied into Identity Crisis, which is one of my favorites. Which he drew, he drew that main series, so it was a nice little touch. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I So Matthew Clark and, and Carl Kershaw, I like their art. I like them both as artists. I don't know that they were the best fit for this. I and I, But this might be my own, my own bias of, of wanting... Again, wanting this to be the Superman version of Gotham Central, I guess in my mind, you know, Michael Lark drew, uh, you know, almost all of, of the Gotham Central series. I think I was yeah. looking for an art style mm -hmm. more in that vein. Like one thing I noticed was, and I'm not, I'm not even saying this was a, the, you know, the artist's choice. I think this, they, I'm sure they were following the script, but the, most of the issues I felt read pretty quickly and the pages were not, were not dense. So, you know, it definitely moved. You know, it, it felt like it was fast-paced, and if that's the intention, they succeeded. I think I would have liked denser pages, to be honest. I would have liked a little bit more packed in. I would have wanted some more narration. I would have wanted to, us to spend a little bit more time in these settings and in these moments. And to your point, I think that would have allowed for a little bit more of that development. Like, I really want... I mean, it, look, what I wanted... And what Rocco wanted to do and what DC wanted, they're not necessarily the same things. But I think if I have one complaint, it's like I wanted I wanted to kind of slow down and like drill down on a lot of these moments. I wanted to spend more time with Clark on these ride alongs. It's like that's I, I if I have one complaint like that's I just wanted more. I don't disagree with you. I usually like a little bit more as well. I w for my taste, I would do it differently, though, rather than making the pages more dense, I would add more issues into the run um, because I, you know, I have to remember, you know, in the early two thousands, right. This is like 2005 or so um, we were really getting into the decompression of the comic book page. We were getting much more into writers who were creating not just individual issues that were compelling, but also trying to structure their storylines so that you had discrete arcs that could easily be collected into a trade paperback of let's say five to seven issues or so. And there's something about that that really appeals to me. Um, I, I think we had, we had really started leaving behind the comics of the 80s and even the, you know, up through the 90s where you were just trying to tell as much story in a single issue as you possibly could because the feeling was if someone's dropping, you know, at this point, I think the price tag was 225 an issue like if someone's dropping their 225 you want to make sure they're getting their money's worth and for me I, that's not as big a consideration as a as a reader and as a consumer as a um you know as a spender um for me i i like the character development i want to see things open up and breathe a little bit but if you're going to perhaps let's say develop lupe more as a character I, I have no problem giving her her own, you know, sort of interlude issue where maybe there's some flashbacks and we see how did she get this position and how did she sort of rise through the ranks to, to become this. That, that would be my style. What we get instead, 
we do have some interludes in this run. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm going to pose the question because the issue that I dropped this run at originally was issue 630, which was the first issue of the Nixius Pitalik interlude. Um, there, this, I love the cover, this Gene Ha cover of like Superman, like drawn on a page and this pencil eraser sort of like erasing him. And it's a Mixie issue. And he just keeps throwing Mixie into this run. And for someone who's trying to craft a very grounded and real police procedural, the Mixie's Pitalik of it all just felt so incongruous tone of the book and it really took me out every single time how did you feel about it yeah this is so funny so it's interesting that i I think we both kind of wanted the same thing but maybe just in different ways Mm -hmm. but i think we still ultimately maybe had the same fundamental uh i don't even want to say problem but but issue the mixy stuff is is fascinating i'm gonna blow your mind here because i know you're expecting me to say oh, i didn't like it because i don't love mixy i don't love magic i actually i actually enjoyed the mixy interludes and i I'm hard pressed to really say exactly what it what it was. So Mixie shows up basically once during each arc because there are yeah. you know this run is broken up into I mean, less than a handful of of, of independent storylines. But again, they, it really all connects into this one ruin uh, story r- run here. And you know so so mix so in an 18 issue run, I mean Mixie shows up and I, I think it's like four. I think there are four specific at least three three to four issues where you get Mixie. Mm-hmm. What I think I liked about him here was that he was trying to help Superman. You know, this idea that Mixie always kind of comes back in different ways. And even going back to Alan Moore's Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, it's like, you know, I spent thousands of years being benign and then I was mischievous and now I'm going to be deadly and, you know, that whole thing. So I really like the fact that he was here to try to help Superman, to try to warn him of this impending crisis that, of course, now we have more context as to, you know, what he was being warned about. So I liked... I guess I liked Mixie's intentions in this. However, I agree with you completely. It is kind of baffling to me that Rucka would devote, and this is where, you know, you, you know, you wonder, because, you know, Infinite Crisis, it seemed like they did have this in the works for a while. It wasn't like the new 52 where it was, like, <laughs> threw it together. <laughs> you know, it seemed like they had it in the works for a while. At the same time, you know, you kind of wonder, maybe, maybe he thought he would have more runway. And I kind of think, Maybe that's the case because if you all, if you know you only have twenty issues, w- would you really devote that many issues to mix his pitalic? Especially when, to your point, it's like when you look at the tone of the rest of the run. Like I said, I think the the two main threads of this run: Lois is embedded overseas in the Middle East in a war zone, and she is shot and nearly dies. And she then spends the rest of the run recovering and trying to find out who pulled the trigger. Yep. Superman is plagued by this, again, this new adversary, Ruin, who is trying to, you know, to crush his spirit and take out those close to him. So it's relatively, I mean, yes, Ruin, we definitely get into sci-fi territory of the new parasites. We have those aliens, you know, that <laughs> Replicon and Slim that you, that you mentioned, yeah. but overall relatively grounded. And so to, to bring in Mixie, <laughs> so out there, yeah, I don't know. I think incongruous is the perfect word. So even though I like them, I enjoy the individual issues, it is a little perplexing to me. And I do feel like given what limited real estate Rucka ended up having, maybe we could have done with like one interlude. <laughs> maybe we didn't need as many yeah. as we got. <laughs> that's that's my feeling is, you know, things get very heavy. And I understand maybe wanting to take one month where you go, Let's take a breather. We'll come back to figuring out whether Lois is going to survive. We'll come back to figuring out whether Ruin is going to succeed in, you know, torturing or killing Lana, P, whoever. Um, and, and, and independent of all that, right, out of the context of the run as a whole, there are these really fun and interesting homages that are built into the mixy sequences. I mean, he homages the Matrix, Looney Tunes, major other DC events, Sin City, Calvin and Hobbes, Superman's animated series, Star Trek. Even They even do this weird sort of um, uh, these like photo comics where the editors themselves, Eddie Braganza, Janine Schaefer, and Mike Carlin, are their photos of them in the DC offices 
they even they go back to that old space ball gag space balls gag of you know playing with your action figures and somebody walks in and catches you and it's not that any of those gags are bad or not funny in any they are they work really well in and of themselves but put back into the context of the run i just i just felt like i just wanted to get back to the run um because i had never made it far enough in originally to see lois get shot that was my favorite storyline of the whole thing. I love when Greg Rucka writes Lois Lane. He writes one of my most favorite Lois Lanes in, up to and including uh, the recent Maxi series, the 12 issue Maxi series of, uh, uh, that he did of Lois Lane, which is just absolutely brilliant. So I was so excited to see Rucka work on the character years before he ever did that. Uh, and I was totally intrigued, but I just kept getting taken out by the, by the mixy stuff. I, I hear you. I don't remember enjoying them at the time. And I think the whole bit with the, those photo sequences, right, where Mixie enters the, the, the world of the DC Comics editorial office at the time, I was kind of like, eh, I don't, this is not my thing. It played better for me now, although, you know, Eddie Braganza stuff. It doesn't age so well, but you know, know. it is what is it is what it is. It was uh, you know, again, product of its time. But uh, so again, I I think I agree with you. Like in a vacuum, they're fine. In the larger context, again, I think for me, it's just more. I just like if I had an opportunity to interview Rucka, I would say like, what was like, what was the thought process behind there? Is it just like you really love Mixie, and you were like, hey, and I mean, I guess the counter argument is maybe because the other issues were on the heavier side. I mean, it's heavy when Lois gets shot. Yeah, that maybe this was an attempt to sort of just kind of lighten the proceedings a bit. I don't think it needed that, but maybe he or editorial did. I mean, I really don't know. Maybe look, maybe this was editorial. They wanted their moment in the sun and they wanted to uh, <laughs> to make their appearance. I I, I don't know. It's, that's hard to say, but yeah, uh, but I definitely can understand if if it lost you uh, a bit there. Yeah, I mean, not enough that that I didn't enjoy the run. I, I still I'm very glad that I read it. And I'm and I enjoyed it more than I anticipated because going back into a run that I had previously left in the middle, I had my hesitation about it. You know, I'll always listen. You give me an opportunity to come on the show, um, I'll take it about anything, whether it's a run I liked, didn't like, never read, want to read again. I'll I'll always be back. But I'll be honest with you, like I definitely when I first started, I was hesitant. Cause I was worried that I was not going to like it and I was going to want to drop it in the middle. I wouldn't have, but I, I, I worried about it. And from the minute I read those first two backup stories, I, I felt like, okay, no, I, I get, I think I get what he's trying to do and what he gives us in those two really, really short stories is the introduction to Lupe as a character and, and her role in the SCU, which I really enjoyed. And the second one I enjoyed even more because he focused entirely on Lois Lane. And it's a silent sequence of her just sort of like milling about the apartment and going about her day and running her errands. And just at the end, she she just misses Clark because he's not home. He's away. And she just, she's lonely. And I love, it's simple and it's streamlined, but it's so incredibly effective. Uh, agreed. I love his Lois and... I know it's going to sound crazy. I have not read that that Lois Lane maxi series. I am well aware of it, and I have other plans for it. So if anyone's like, hey, you're talking about Rucka, why aren't you talking about that Lois Lane mini series? <laughs> well, I have other plans for that. We'll get there. But, and uh, if I'm the Rucka guy, I think I have to be on it. Yeah, I think there's a good. I think there's a good chance uh, you'll get the call for that, my friend. <laughs> you know, in, in terms of Rucka's characterization uh, of these figures here, I loved... The, the opening pages of his first issue where Superman is saving, you know, coming to the aid of this little girl who's been separated from her mother in the, in the crowd. And he reunites them and the mother, you know, she's grateful, but also apologetic. And she's like, I'm sure you have more important things to do. And he goes, not really. And, you know, I think you can take that in a couple of ways. Maybe it was a quiet day for him, but I don't think that was the <laughs> meaning there. I think, you know, for him, you know, being able to bring you know, a mother and daughter together after a difficult moment like that is as important to him as anything that he would do. And so I love that. I think there's a calm to the character that he exudes throughout most of this run. The, the Clark 
the Clark of it all was interesting. I think Rucka definitely plays up the the mild manneredness. There are, you know, a few touches, especially when he's at the shack and he's going along on the ride along and you know, he pretends to have cut himself shaving and he's got toilet paper <laughs> stuck to his face and you know, he kind of fumbles with his words a little bit. You know, it's not again, it's not an over the top shtick, but it definitely points to, you know, some efforts that the character takes to, you know, uh, you know, dispel any notion that he could be Superman. I think the the, and I'll, I know I'll toss it to you, but I think the moment that stood out to me was he's on the ride along and he's in the helicopter and, you know, all hell breaks loose, right? And he pretends to fall out of the helicopter as Clark into a dumpster. And then he's, you know, does what he needs to do as Superman. And then Lupe and Skeeter, probably the other SCU guy, they're talking about, about Clark. And I think Skeeter's like, oh, he fell out of the helicopter. And as Superman, he has, there's this one panel where he just kind of looks down and closes his eyes. And then the next page, you know, he's as, as Clark coming out of the dumpster covered in, in, in trash. <laughs> and I just imagine in that moment where he's Superman and his eyes are closed and his head is lowered, he's just thinking to himself like, God damn it. Like, I got, and this is my reading of it. Maybe mm-hmm. it was not the intention. <laughs> it was like, oh, I gotta like get back in a dumpster now. And like after all this, it just, because <laughs> you think about what this guy would feel like. He's like, oh, that's right. Like I threw myself out of the helicopter. They think I'm in a dumpster. Like, I gotta go cover myself in trash now. Yeah, the things I got to do to keep up this dual identity thing. The 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 indignities I have to suffer to do. But he does it. And he and and I think that that scene actually connects me back really well to the scene where he reunites that that girl with her mother because you know, the mother's comment would seem to also imply that this is something of an indignity for him, right? The guy who can, you know, stop a raging volcano or, or, you know, stop an alien invasion or, you know, something world shattering is going to take any time out of his day to even notice a little girl who got separated from her mother. Um, I, I'm reminded, and, and I remember thinking this when I read it, I'm reminded of this sort of, um, this sort of Jewish value thing. And I believe Greg Rucka is at least partially Jewish, I believe, um, where uh, there's this philosophy that if you save one life, you save, it's like you've saved the entire world. Because for that person, that is the world. For that person's family and friends and circle, like that is the world. And so for him, he's not lowering himself to save one person. He is in, in a sense saving the world and if he has to you know emerge from a dumpster with the banana peel on his head in order to do that well that's just fine yeah no well said for sure and another thing too is we got some i think we get some really good interpersonal drama with uh clark and pete and lana i want to circle back to that but the the other i guess big picture thing is as superman whether it's with the parasite twins or, you know, later ultimately with ruin himself, with replicon, with Zlim, even when he has to stop them, it's still, he's still always coming from a place of, I can help you. You don't have to do this. You know, we talked about in the Casey run, Casey had this take on Superman as a pacifist. And we, we talked about whether and to what extent that, that really worked. I, I prefer the track here where, you know, I don't know that this, the Superman of Ruckus Run would necessarily describe himself as a pacifist, but there's kindness and compassion driving everything that he's doing. And, and that just comes across time and time again. I mean, the fact that even with ruin, <laughs> with everything ruin has done and the, the, and by the way, I know we we're not saying who ruin is and I don't want to make it sound <laughs> like we're going to get to the end of this and not say who it is. And I'm probably like, why am I delaying this? Um, you know, I hate, it's, it's funny, going back to this idea of this run being kind of overlooked, I, I suspect there are a lot of people who haven't read this, and part of me is like, oh, like I don't want to spoil, I don't want to spoil this, but at the same time, again, it, this is years and years old, and it's not readily available, so it's not one of those things where I could be like, hey, I'm not going to spoil it, why don't you go read it? It's like, I, I can't really give you that direction, so hopefully people don't mind, and I suspect most Superman fans probably already know. Uh, we do, well, ha- bef- And before you reveal it, too, I'll say, like, I think one of the best ways to listen to this podcast is to know what the episode's about, read the material that's going to be covered, and then listen to the episode. Because I feel like you're going to get so much more out of it if you do that, as opposed to listening first, which 
isn't a bad way to do it, but you just risk some of the things being spoiled. And if you're okay with that, then, you know, by all means. It's funny because I hear mostly from people who say that the show prompted them to to go read something or reread something, which is cool. So it seems like people listen first. Usually they're not necessarily doing the homework with us ahead of time, which is totally fine. And then I do think there are a lot of instances where maybe this is the way that they experience it is through a conversation about it, which is totally valuable too. It's it's and I think about stuff that I listen to as well. I mean, I might not always you know, read or watch or listen to what, what I'm hearing in a, on a podcast, but you know, that's okay. Like that's the way I'm experiencing. So it's interesting. I know it's different for everybody, but there is a misdirect at a certain point in the storyline. It appears that, um, not, it appears ruin is unmasked as Pete Ross Clark's childhood friend turned vice president, turned president of the United States. Uh, but we find out that that is a misdirect. He's been, he's been used by the real ruin who turns out to be none other and it breaks my triangle era love and heart, <laughs> Professor Emil Hamilton. No, say it ain't so. And, but even in that, even though he's been betrayed by someone who's been an ally and a friend, and Hamilton has gone after people close to him, even, even then, he's still trying to help him, and he's still saying you don't have to do this. And, I, you know, I was thinking about that a lot as I'm uh, reading these stories. You know, we always talk about this idea, you know, if you want to hurt Superman, you know, it's the heart. And yes, yeah. going after people close to him. Yes, that's the obvious way. But I feel like, too, it, it's like I felt for the character in his pleading with his former friend. And it's like that must hurt so much, too, not just to be betrayed, but it's like, hey, I, I'll still extend my hand to you. Like, just just stop. Like, just let this go. And, you know, Hamilton just can't. I I felt like it was. It was an odd choice. <laughs> was I just too forward? I just, I just, I, the reveal that it was Emil Hamilton, which again, I didn't know because I hadn't actually finished the run. And I just, there wasn't as much sort of so the social media thing hadn't quite exploded the way that it is. So I just didn't know. Um, and, and I felt like it was an odd choice because especially having revisited some of the triangle era stuff with you not that long ago, Emil Hamilton was one of Superman's fiercest allies. I mean, he was the tech guy. He would provide suits and, and other technology that Superman needed to fight whatever villains were plaguing him at the moment. And I just didn't quite understand the turnaround. I mean, I, I, even now I'm, I'm not entirely clear of his, his motives. I just, to see that character become this just didn't make sense. Okay. So I'm a little mixed on this. I won't lie. So first of all, for anyone, you know, if, if you don't have a clear mind of the ruined character, it's this blue, uh, not blue, uh, <laughs> orange and black uh, color scheme. He's got the black mask, uh, or orange mask and, and black outfit and these like red tubes that end up being like teleportation tubes. He's using the phantom mm -hmm. zone uh, to teleport himself. <laughs> I dug the look of the character. I, I did like the orange and black. I thought that was a, a badass color scheme. And throughout this run, right, right from the very beginning, he's sending uh, these alien adversaries, Replicon and then Zlim, after Superman to, <clears throat> to test his abilities and to drain his power. Uh, there's a point where Ruin is apprehended and he's in the SC, SCU transport van and he's explaining a bit about why he's doing this before he kills all of the other officers, including poor Skeeter, who we were just getting to know. He yeah. could have been the new Dan Turpin, but he didn't make it. <laughs> But he talks about how <laughs> this is where I mix because he talks about how and we don't know this is Hamilton yet. Right. We, we just know it's ruined. He talks about how Superman's absorption of solar energy is, is killing the sun and the sun will die in four and a half billion years. You know, and they laugh at him in the van and he's like mockery is a sign of ignorance. And I was saying to myself, mm -hmm. buddy. There's this thing called climate change. We don't have four and a half billion years, so I wouldn't worry so much. <laughs> worry so much about Superman. Um, but you know, regardless of who it ended up being, but especially since it ended up being Emil, that 
motive. And he repeats it again. I mean, it's, you know, that seems to be at the heart of, of this, which again, I think points to your frustration and my, my feeling mixed on it because had there been more to account for Emil's turn, I think it would have landed better. It def, it definitely felt like it came out of nowhere. I mean, he had not gotten a lot of play in the books in a really long time. I mean, in the Loeb Kelly era, he came back a bit. I know Mark Schultz used him primarily in Man of yeah. Steel. And even when he returned, there was this whole bit where he felt like he had been sidelined because Superman was working with Steel more regularly. And there right. was this whole arc where the, the B-13 tech on his arm was controlling him and he was, he was quote unquote evil for, for, for a spell. Yeah. And let's not forget, when he was initially introduced during the Marv Wolfman uh, period on Adventures, it was initially as a, as a villain. And then he had this turn, which that cuts both ways. Because on the one hand, I'm like, well, okay, it's, you know, part of his character. So it's not, it's not so out of left field. But at the same time, I think there's a lot to be said for redemption and for the idea that someone can change. And so I think if, if our ultimate takeaway here is like, he came on the scene as this troubled mad scientist villain. And that's kind of all he ended up being in the end. It's kind of like, well, what's the point? <laughs> you know, what's yeah. the point of it? So, the motivation aspect <clears throat> really, uh, I, I think, was, was was kind of a tough a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, and I and I get that that whoever it ended up being, it needed to be someone, you know, near or in Superman's inner circle because the, the you know the whole. Um, the whole thrust is going after the people closest to Superman. So someone would have to have observed Superman interacting, interacting with certain people more often than others. Obviously, if you, if anyone's, if anyone in actual Metropolis is paying attention, it's Lois, it's Perry, it's Jimmy, it's Lana, it's Pete. I mean, you, you're going to see those characters continue to come as opposed to, let's say the young girl reunited with the mother who's a one. off, Right. Um, so I get that. And, you know, it allows Rucka to do something fun with the, with the misdirect of it being Pete, who at that point is, you know, really struggling with the fact that he was Lex Luthor's vice president. Luthor had left office in disgrace. Pete now is the president. He's, let's face it, probably ill-equipped for that job. Um, his marriage with Lana is kind of on the rocks, um, like having nothing to do with his presumed super villainy she's already considering leaving him and you know so it's it, that one doesn't quite come out of left field but he does maintain his innocence the whole time and it doesn't look good for him because i mean he was literally unmasked publicly um and it turns out it was you know he's teleported in right at the moment of the unmasking and then you know, um so i get that it needs to be someone in the inner circle and that and that speaks to sort of a larger trope that I've become sort of less tolerant of over the years, which is that every new villain has to be someone, that it has to be someone who's previously established for the shock value. It's the cousin, it's the mother, it's the ex-girlfriend, it's, you know, and, and, and I get it, like the weight now of the hero villain relationship is steeped in what the relationship between the civilian characters are. And it adds a little bit more weight. And I get it at the same time for me, the, the sort of joy maybe of adding a new villain into the mythology is to truly make it a new villain to give the villain a motivation that is independent of any characters we know before, and something different than we've seen from any of the other villains. And I think that there are ways to do that. So to kind of go back to characters we know and just say, nope, evil again, uh, seems in, a, in an uncharacteristic move for Rucka, a little, and I hate to use this word because I love you, Greg Rucka, a little lazy. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really necessarily disagree. And I wonder too, if this was always the intention, I do sort of think it was because, you know, Rucka does reintroduce Emil Hamilton. He comes on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with Star Labs and consulting with the SCU to try to figure out who, who Ruin is just as Pete Ross reenters the scene. And, you know, a very key development with Pete, we find out via flashback that when for the brief period of time where President Lex knew that Clark was Superman, he shared that information with Pete. Yeah. When I did the death to wedding part one with Bernie and we were talking about the doomsday wars and the birth of Lana and Pete's son, you know, I said, I was like, it's, it's really friggin' messed up that the Clark never told Pete. I mean, it's, 
I don't know, a slap in the face to someone he's known his whole life and is is friends with, but also, you know, put Lana in a, t- in a very difficult spot to have to lie to her husband. So I, I like that we finally crossed that bridge. I don't know that that has stuck. I, I can't think of a ton of Pete appearances in, in recent memory, and I, maybe I'm sure I'm just forgetting. People let me know where Pete popped up again and if this were if this was referenced. But I appreciated that at least for a, a, a moment in time, Pete knew. So that was a big development. I So again, we have... It's, it's, it seems pretty clear, right? The fact that Ruin is going to such lengths to avoid being unmasked and, and, and you know, to avoid being, uh, you know, I, I identified, right? There's lead on his mask and it's attached and, and all that stuff. And he's um, in lead-lined layers and soundproofed and, and everything. Although Superman very cleverly realizes, well, I can look to see where I can't, you know, uh, see and hear and, and that will kind of clue me in. So I like that. Anyway, but... You know, so we see there we have a couple of contenders and a couple people coming back. What I did appreciate was I feel like in any mystery, it needs to be something that you could figure out. And had Emil not been part of this story at all, I mean, then it really would have been out of nowhere. So that was actually one of the fun things. Because I do think this is the first time I ever reread this run, knowing that he's ruined. You know, you see him show up and uh, you know, he's asking them questions about what they know about the about the suit and everything. And, you know, he's at at Strikers when, uh, you know, Pete Ross seemingly escapes, and like all the stuff that you look back and like, OK, you know, that that tracks again. It's not a great mystery, but I feel like it at least adheres to the rules of a mystery for the most part. And as a counterpoint to that, I don't mean to always beat up on it, but, you know, the ending to Batman Hush, like I kind of always drove me nuts. You know, because it's just like, again, I think I assume people know at this point, you know, the fact that Riddler's the one pulling the strings and it's like he had one fleeting appearance in an earlier issue. And it's like, that's not enough. I, I you know, it, it needs to be something that you can go back and it's like, oh, man, all the, all the pieces kind of fit into place. So I don't think it's an expertly, con, you know, constructed mystery here. I would not go out on that limb. But I did feel like, OK, at least all of the players were on the board. And when you go back and read it, it tracks. So. You know, that, that, that was okay. Although, let me ask you this. This was a big thing that I was, that, that really struck me. Clark realizes that it has to be a meal in the final Mixus Pitalik issue where we're heading into infinite crisis territory. Magic in the DC universe is, is a muck and Mixie can't really think straight. He can't get back to the fifth dimension. He's in this black and white world. <laughs> he's at a diner with Clark and he's trying to talk Clark through what's going on and And Clark has this moment of realization of like, who, it has to be Emil. I thought that was a very odd way to reveal to Clark and the audience who the big bad of this entire run was. And I wondered if you felt the same or if, here's my only, the only counterpoint to that that I wonder, the counter argument I can make is, was, was the, the idea that it was so obvious at that point that the audience would know who it is, that we didn't need a big reveal. What was your take on that? That was so odd to me. Well, I mean, think about the elements that you just sort of put together, right? It's it's several of the elements that frustrated me about the run, right? It's the reveal of Emil Hamilton as Ruin combined with the Mixius Pitalik interlude. <laughs> and, and so for me, and look, what you're alluding to here is that is that a mystery... The the reveal of a mystery should always be simultaneously uh, inevitable and surprising. And I'll say this, like it is, it is surprising, but it never quite reached inevitability for me. Um, It it just seems like Clark lands on it almost arbitrarily Um, because he says it's got to be a meal. And I thought, it does <laughs> says who why oh I, I um and again to to have couched that realization in a mixy sequence I, I at that point i just i was so out of the story at that point that it i i, I didn't feel that sense of shock and awe that i think i was supposed to feel which is unfortunate because you know it should have been a bigger it should have been a bigger moment. And I know it's hard to craft a good mystery in serialized monthly comic books. Uh, if, if for no other reason than, as we've stated a few times, 
towards the end of the run, he had to incorporate tie-ins to multiple events. And so that interrupts the flow. And, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe just having been interrupted. And, and remember, we, the stuff we didn't even read would have been part of that flow too. So that the one Shazam tie-in that Judd Winnick wrote, like that's taking up a month of space. Um, the two other issues that were the, the actual sacrifice tie-in, those are taking up actual months. And so by the time you get to the reveal, you've got all that baggage behind you. And that compounds uh, how difficult it is to make the mystery work. So part of it, I think I have to lay at Ruppel's feet, but a lot of it, I think we have to give him the benefit of the doubt for and just say it's just the unfortunate byproduct of sort of corporate serialized superhero storytelling. Well said. I, I think that there, yeah, I think there were just a few unfortunate factors colliding here. And, and yeah, it, it does fall a bit, a bit flat in terms of how it's revealed to the audience in terms of how Clark figures it out in terms of who it is and in terms of why Emil is ultimately doing this. And, and that's the thing I, I would have. And again, even though I had read it before, I didn't remember. I was, I was hoping that there was going to be something else behind it. I mean, they had, like I said, in, in those Mark Schultz, man of steel issues, they had already played with this idea that, you know, Emil felt overlooked and sidelines. So I don't, you know, that would have been retreading old ground, but I don't know, at least it would have been something, you know, I, I think a major disconnect with this is that Ruin's whole approach seems to be so personal. Yeah. Right. He's going after Superman in this personal way. You know, it seems at points, it seems like he knows that Clark is Superman, but that turns out not to be the case. And, and in fact, you know, when he, when he creates the parasite twins, he sends them to Lois and Clark's apartment to, you know, drain Lois and obtain her knowledge of, of who Superman is. And we also, again, in terms of infinite crisis tie-ins, there are a couple little breadcrumbs here. It seems like he's working for Lex at a certain point or working with Lex. Turns out he's working with a Lex, uh, but <laughs> the, the pre-crisis on infinite earths, um, Lex from earth three, who will find out mm -hmm. all of that, but our Lex who's left the White House and is running around in the, the green war suit. That's not the one that he's working with. But anyway, you know, he never actually knows that Clark is Superman, but he's, he's, he's taking this personal approach, yet the reason for it is ultimately not personal. It seems more environmental, you know, anti-alien yeah. sentiment. So I think that's where it's, it sort of fell apart for me as well. And all, then now I'm, now I'm going to nitpick for a second here, but also... <laughs> especially the beginning part of the run where Ruin is trying to get all these readings on Superman, mm -hmm. collect all this data. It's like, buddy, do you not have enough data on this guy? You were, and he Ruin specifically, you know, Hamilton specifically talks about, like, I've had access to your fortress, your Kryptonian technology. There are plenty of stories that we read where he's running all of these scans and diagnostics on Superman. It's like, what more do you need? <laughs> now, a little agree. nitpicky, you know, but you know. No, but, but you said it and I, I wasn't thinking it myself, but now that you said it, of course, right? I mean, he would have had years of data. The, the ups and downs, the fluctuations in his power levels, the comings and goings of his abilities, his reactions to different types of kryptonite. I mean, it's all there during the years that Hamilton was an active part of the book. Uh, yeah, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't track. Yeah, and I, look, I always... Is growing up reading the Triangle Era, you know, he was a regular member of the supporting cast. I mean, it's, you know, it only would have broke my heart more if it was Bibbo, you know. Oh, <laughs> they better never do that. <laughs> but, you know, I think of the death of Superman. We always go back there, but I think of the death of Superman and Emil and Bibbo on the roof, you know, firing that blaster, trying to help. And it's like, that's the guy now who's who's trying to take him out. It's It's a sad turn. And I think to... To really undermine a character like that, I think there needs to be more of a reason for it. So, you know, I didn't, this was not my all-time favorite reveal. I'm kind of torn because I, clearly we're led to believe that it's Pete, right? I mean, it's, we have the issue where he's on Master's Room, but even leading up to that, he's going through this divorce with Lana. You know, he has a line where he's like, I don't think Lana ever loved me. You know, he's at a low point. We find out that he has the knowledge that Clark is Superman, so... You know, is he feeling betrayed? It would be understandable if he were. And it's it's funny with all of that because on the one hand, that that makes it too obvious. But at the same time, 
you stack all of that up and it's like, oh, okay, that actually would have been like a more compelling, <laughs> it actually would have made a lot more sense if he had this personal grudge. Like my, mar- my, my marriage and my family fell apart. You've been lying to me my whole life. It's, I don't, I'm so torn on this. Would you have wanted Pete to be ruined? Well, and, and the third connective point is as his marriage is falling apart and he wonders at whether Lana ever loved him, the person he knows that she loved and probably still does is Clark. So if he now knows that Clark is Superman, that all connects. Uh, and that is, a, I, I think, a very compelling motivation for Pete, who we would never expect to become a villain, to become a villain. I mean, that to me would work. Um, I think it would need to have been seeded maybe a little bit more subtly throughout. Um, to make it to make it stick, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd be on board with that. Pete's an interesting character, man, because I feel like, you know, why am I torn on it? I'm torn on it because I don't want, I don't want to put Pete through that. But at the same time, you know, what's the line between uh, from Infinite Crisis number one with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman on the moon, where where Batman burns superman is as badly verbally as, as he's ever gotten mm-hmm. he's like let's face it superman the last time you inspired anyone was when you were dead i kind of look at the character of pete and in my mind it's like oh good old pete like his buddy but pete pete almost never has anything to do really so part of me is like yeah well, even he, as president of the united states he doesn't have that much to do that's the thing so i'm kind of like i'm gonna argue against myself because i'm saying well <laughs> if if we give him this well, at least that's something, you know, at least that gives him something to do. You know, we always bring it back to Smallville. I mean, poor Pete on Smallville, like I had nothing to do. Yeah. I, you know, he found out Clark's secret and that at least, that at least gave something. But, you know, I think that his biggest episode was his final one where the FBI agent was like roughing him up to get information on Clark and Lex, Lex rescues him. And then he's like, I got to leave town. I know I was going to say the the, you know, as soon as he finds out the secret, oh, well, not as soon as, but shortly after they write him off the show. Because there just wasn't enough for him to do, especially when you have Lex and Lana and Chloe. And I mean, there's there's other characters who I guess just sort of became more compelling. And and I liked Pete and I liked the actor who played him. I really liked the character as he was portrayed on the show. But but yeah, it just seemed like they didn't know what to do with him. I always whether it's Smallville or the comics, I, I do always want Clark to have a buddy. Yeah. You know, Lois, of course, is the most you know important relationship. And, you know, maybe now that, that, you know, John Kent in the comics is, is older and Superman's coming back to earth and all of that, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe we'll get, but even then it's, it's still, it's, I mean, like my son is my buddy, but it's a little bit different. It's not, it's the, not same. the same. Yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same. So uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly on Smallville, I always wish that we, we had gotten more of that. Uh, I had hoped that, you know, Jimmy would turn into something like that and they, they never went in that direction with poor Henry James. So I know, I know it's in any event. Uh, you know, as as we're talking about this, I do sort of feel like, yeah, maybe this was a missed opportunity to do something with Pete. Now, at the same time, I did really love that even after Ruin has been unmasked as Pete Ross and he's sitting in this cell and he's just gotten this beat down from Lupe. You know, we talked yeah. about how she's not afraid to break the rules. I mean, <clears throat> more specifically, you know, she cuts the, the camera feed. She goes in and she pummels the the former president of the United States. And, you know, going back to an earlier interrogation when she's uh, interrogating the alien Zlim, right, who's been under the control of Ruin. I mean, it's very clear to us and to Superman, who's very vocal about this, that he was not in control of his actions. I mean, she's really going after him. She calls him an alien piece of trash, which yeah. Superman clocks, you know, definitely. And he calls her on it. And after the the beatdown of Pete Ross, like he, he really um, goes at her and he uh, crumples up her badge. Again, she ultimately has a moment of redemption at the end where it looks like she sacrifices herself to save the Ross family. She ends up living, which I actually thought, it's like, eh, I feel that feels, un, I feel like that's too, uh, not too generous to the character, but it just sort of felt like that would have had more of a, of an impact if she had made the sacrifice. And given that explosion, it really seemed like that would have been it anyway. Yeah, but I, on, on the flip side though, if you, if, if Ruck is going to spend the time to introduce this character and develop her to the extent 
to which he developed her. I think the hope is that even when he's no longer writing the book, that this is now a character who can go on and, and sort of have a life of her own and other writers can take the ball and, and run with it. So he's, you know, created a toy for the toy box and then leaves it for the other kids to play with and to, you know, to kill her off at the end of the run is to not that characters in comics stay dead all that often, but, you know, even so, the, you know, no, oh, that's a good point because it's, and again, I don't think she has been used. So it's easy in retrospect to be like, well, she was never used. They could have killed her off, but you're right. I mean, leaving that available presents an opportunity, even if others don't, don't pick up on it. So I'm with you. But what I was going to say was when, when, as Clark, when Clark goes to interview Pete Ross in prison, you know, even then, like, even after he's been unmasked, like Clark, like Clark still believes his friend. Yeah. And I like that. And so that's that's where it's like I I would hate to lose that if if Ru, if he did turn out to be ruined. So I like the fact that he he still believed his friend. And you know, they have this moment where, you know, they have to be careful about what they're saying, right? And so Pete like whispers and he has to use his super hearing to know that, you know, yeah, Lex told me that you're Superman. I mean, we there's not enough time. There's not enough real estate to really dig into the fact that Clark had kept the secret from him and I and I wish there were. And I don't think there's any better example of the lack of time in these issues than in the final one we read, where it ends with Superman and the Rosses on the rooftop, and Lana or Pete says something like, "Oh, how are we gonna how you know how are we gonna clear Pete's name?" And Superman's like, "Oh, it won't take long." And it's like <laughs> literally the last panel is just the headline of yeah. the Daily Planet, like President Ross cleared. That was it. I mean, I think that I think Infinite Crisis just really truncated everything. It did. It did. And, and again, it's, you know, it's an unfortunate byproduct. I, and I think a lot of the problems that, that you're mentioning here could have been solved with either or both of our solutions, which we brought up, which is either put a little bit more into each page or add a couple more issues in to make up for the time that you had to sacrifice to other, to other things. And it's funny, I was, you know, I'm listening to you talk about, you know, Clark and Pete's relationship and, and how that friendship really could stand to be a little bit more developed over the over the years and if we want to add a new wrinkle to what might have made Pete a good fit for actually being ruined would be that you know Clark and Pete were buddies in Smallville and then Clark left Smallville and in the same way that he left Lana behind and, and found Lois he left Pete behind and his buddy is Jimmy Olsen and you know there's got to be a little bit of resentment there that you you know you have no more use for me because you know you left me and Lana behind you married Lois you've got Jimmy you've got your career and and we're just the you know the country bumpkins who you know get left behind I mean there is I think there is enough to mind there that that would have made him a compelling villain and then you add in a little bit more time to develop the story and to seed it in a little bit more subtly and it, yeah, this could have really worked in a different way. And then look, and then as Ruin, he could look up his old Smallville high classmate, Kenny Braverman, and we could get a Ruin conduit team up. Uh, you know, there this, you thing, go. this thing writes itself. Any excuse to get conduit back. There, I mean, this look, this, <laughs> there might've been some missed opportunities here. And I, I agree. I think had that Judd Winnick Shazam thing been its own miniseries, if, I've always, well, I, again, we'll get to this, but I've always felt that sacrifice storyline should have either been its own miniseries or better yet, it really should have just been part of the OMAC miniseries, yeah. the OMAC project. Yeah. So you take those issues bags, three more issues to play with, you know, that, that could change things a little bit. And cut the mixy interludes from like four down to one. Yeah. And you have even more room to play with. And suddenly we've got all the time in the world. Yeah, I do think that I do think that would have made a big difference. Now, I know we've been talking about ways in which Infinite Crisis, you know, kind of hindered the proceedings a little bit. I will say that there were a couple of of really cool intersection points that I I was like, "Oh, that's a clever way to to tie into what's been going on." You know, as much as we're talking Infinite Crisis, this really started with Identity Crisis, right? right. And the idea that you had the heroes lobotomizing villains, right, who had gone too far, who had learned too much. And they're dealing with the ramifications of that. And so that that one issue in particular that has the Identity Crisis logo on the cover and that Rags Morales drew. And right. I felt like that's the thing when I talk about the artists. 
and who I think is a better fit. I, like I look at that Rags Morales issue, I'm like, oh, I just feel like this fits Rucka and this this run better. I would have loved to have seen more, obviously. But in any event, I'm glad we at least got that one. But what was cool there was, you know, Superman's dealing with a villain who seems to know a lot about him and who is attacking him personally. You know, I think at this point, Jimmy's probably in the hospital. I think that's that's happened at this point. And, you know, Lois has been shot. We haven't figured out exactly, you know, what that was about. We'll get there. But, um, you know, he, you know, he's in a tough spot. And, of course, this is bringing up everything that the League went through in Identity Crisis with the, the Dr. Light business coming to light and the murder of, of Sue Dibney. And so the fact that he's making that connection and he's summoning Wonder Woman and Batman, you know, to have this conversation, I was like, oh, like this totally, it makes sense that, that he would that he would make that connection and that they would talk about this. So I really, that piece of it, I thought fit very seamlessly. Yeah, their philosophical discussion about when, if ever, it's appropriate for heroes to either kill or in the case of what the Justice League had done to Batman after the the Dr. Light thing to, to mind wipe so that they can keep their secrets. Um, I thought actually fit really well with what was happening in the regular run, because again, you know, Superman risks losing people very, very close to him. And you have a villain who, you know, like Max Lord in, uh, in the coming storyline, who's basically said, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep doing this and I'm, and I'm going to manipulate and I'm going to, you know, attack. And, and unless you kill me, I will not stop. And so when is it appropriate? I love the discussion. That was one of my actual, actually my favorite issues and moments of this whole run was him was ruckus and because, and probably because he slows it down a little bit so they can have this conversation about, because we as fans have that conversation all the time, right? Why doesn't the Batman just kill the Joker? And we debate back and forth. And some people say no, because that makes him just as bad as the villains. And other people say, yeah, I mean, how many lives would he have saved if he just killed this guy who, you know, keeps coming out of the revolving door of Arkham Asylum? I love those discussions. And, and, it, and this is why I said at the, the beginning of our talk that Ruck is one of those writers, I think, who very skillfully was able to take what was given to him, because that wasn't his story, and work it in in a way that makes it seem like it was always part of the run to begin with. Yes. And I think this is an instance where, you know, this run so benefits from the fact that he's writing all three characters, right? He has their yeah. voices down. We catch up with Wonder Woman at a very specific moment is where she's been blinded. And so she's got the red blindfold on. But yes. what what I liked about this story and about this era generally, and that's why I really am excited to to do the, what we're going to do next year, because I feel like, and you got a great encapsulation of it in, in this issue we're talking about, where you see there, the three of them and the, the, the viewpoint, the distinct viewpoint that each one has. Like when they're talking about Dr. Light, you know, Batman, of course, is fundamentally opposed to what was done to Dr. Light. And then, of course, you know, of course to him, and you know, but <laughs> the, the idea of the, the mind wipe, we find, you know, and Wonder Woman, of course, is like, you shouldn't have done that. You should have killed him. Right. And, you know, a great setup for what she will later do to Max Lord. But it's like, yeah, man, like that totally fits her character. It's like, no, this is a monster. And sometimes you have to put a monster down. And it's like to, you know, to alter his mind, to like, you know, take away his identity. That's you know, almost like worse. It's like <laughs> better just, just slay the beast. And so that was great. But what I, man, what I loved about this was when they're talking about it, Batman says to Superman, he says, you knew? Because that was one of the things at the end of Brad Meltzer's identity crisis where they're talking about what Superman knew because he wasn't physically present for the, right. the mind alteration of Dr. Light or yeah, he, didn't mind vote. he wasn't there for the vote. And I, I think I don't know if it's Flash or Green Lantern. I think <clears> a couple of them were having that conversation at the end of identity crisis. And it's like, do you think he knows? It's like, how, how could he not know given who he is and his, his, his powers? And so you get, you know, he acknowledges that here. And he talks about how, you know, basically like there was no great option. And he says like, what was I going to do? Bring in half the league. It's like, I didn't agree with what they did, but it was done. And I, and he says, and this is where, you know, I always go back to the, the core, you know, of who this character is and the Clark of it. And he's like, you know, I thought about, you know, Dr. Light and Sue Dibney's like, I thought about if that were Lois or my parents, it's like, you know, it, it, it was what it was essentially. But I love that we had that acknowledgement because I came out of identity crisis and I said to myself, 
And this is where, you know, other Superman fans might differ and might feel like, no, like he's this paragon of virtue. He would never go along with this. He would never know about it and allow it. I feel like there are, there are moments where, you know, there, there is that, you know, that, that, that little bit of gray area. And I feel like this is an instance where it, it tracked. It didn't feel like, oh man, this obliterates his, his character. It's like, nah, I, I think that would be the case. And so I love that we got a payoff to that. I really, really did. And I'll take it one step further. Not only do we get that, but this was the absolute perfect place for them to have this conversation. The three of them together certainly could have been in an issue of Justice League. Like this conversation with three of them could have been in that. Um, But the fact that it was in the Superman book, I mean, Adventures of Superman, but in a Superman book means that what you set up there was, you know, Batman is staunchly against. Wonder Woman is very much in favor of it when necessary and our pov character is the one in the middle our pov character right our superman for the adventures of superman book is the audience surrogate because we don't necessarily know whether we agree completely with batman or whether we agree completely with wonder woman and and by putting our character in the middle it put it asks the reader to try to decide and, and you know it's 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 posing the question to us, which is exactly what this should do, right? It's it's a broad philosophical question that has been asked in superhero comics for a long time, and we the readers need to wrestle with it. And and Superman is likewise wrestling with it, and and he takes it even further when he gets to the Infinite Crisis stuff because it's at that point after Lois has has healed from her wounds that the two of them discuss at what point a hero like him might have to kill a villain and it's and it's happening roughly at the same time where she proposes the idea of the two of them having a baby together and that just adds now another human who is you know clark's flesh and blood who would be essentially a target should a villain ever discover his identity or the way ruin did you know just have this intimate knowledge of who Superman's familiars are and and go after it. And he says that to Lois, like, I don't want to bring a child into this world knowing like we just went through this and it was this time it was, you know, Lana and Pete and you, but if we've got a child, I don't know that I could stand that. I don't know that I could go out and do what I do knowing that I'm leaving a child behind who's going to be in danger. So, the the in, the identity crisis conversation coupled with the infinite crisis conversations with Lois, I thought were some of the high points of this run. So yeah, you know, on the one hand, we're complaining about how much real estate the tie-ins sort of take up, but again, a deft writer like Rucka is able to capitalize it, capitalize on it in ways that I wouldn't have expected, but I was really really pleased by. It. Totally, yeah, I think they really did dovetail very nicely there. And, you know, as far as conversations with Lois and Clark, you know, they also talk about Wonder Woman's killing of Maxwell Lord. And Lois says, like, no, I think she did the right thing. I mean, look, we've talked about this on the show. I've given my take on Superman killing. I don't see it as this absolute line in the sand that I know other Superman fans see. And that's fine. We can we can see it differently. But, I, yeah, I liked – look, I, I remain a, a, a fan of Identity Crisis and what it set up in the DCU. And I know, you know, there are those who feel it was too dark. And certainly I know that the, the violence that is perpetrated against Sue Dibney in the book is, is remains controversial, but I, you know, it remains one of my favorite DC stories because of the humanity it brought to all these characters and it treated them like people. And so yes. I think it created a great springboard to get to stories like this, where you have this conversation with Bruce and Clark and Diana and you get these different perspectives. And it continues to pay off where, you know, at, of course, at the end of the sacrifice storyline, Wonder Woman kills Max Bellore because he's controlling, mind controlling Superman. And this is captured and broadcast on screens across the world. And so you do have in this adventures run, you get, you know, people, you know, not knowing what to make of this and you get some split opinions. But at the end of the story, at the end of the run, you know, Ruin essentially sets up the same type of scenario for Superman right? Where there are cameras capturing what's happening. And he's like, my armor is going to self-destruct whether I'm in it or not. The only way to stop it is to kill me, but everyone's going to see you do it just like Wonder Woman. So of course, Superman finds a way. He quickly dismantles it and flies (laughs) it up into the sky. 
you know, glad it worked out. I'm glad he didn't have to resort to killing Emil. But you know what? If there were no way to dismantle that equipment and he had to, I, I probably would have sent him to the Phantom Zone. He still would have found another way. But, uh, <laughs> but probably, yeah. but you know, but yeah, I mean, I think there, I, I think you have yeah, more, more than not in this run. I think Rucka was able to to make effective use of what was going on in the rest of the books. I agree. And I'm not going to repeat anything that you just said, because I agree with all of it, but just to demonstrate that I agree with you about identity crises place in the, in the DC uh, timeline um, and its importance. Uh, you know, I teach a, a graphic lit class in, uh, in the high school, in which I teach and I do a unit on superheroes, which I call American mythology. And Mostly it's smaller samples of comics that span from you know, all the way to the gold, beginning of the golden age, basically to the to the present, where I've had I have students read sort of an issue here and issue to get a flavor of what is what a golden age story looks like or what a bronze age story looks like, et cetera. But there are two full-length stories that I have the students read, one from Marvel and one from DC. For Marvel, it's Civil War, because I think the questions that it asks about, you know freedom and security and, and all those things are really important and as relevant now, maybe more so than, than they were at the time. And the DC story is identity crisis because I think it also asks, it forces students to ask some really important questions about the nature of heroism and how far you go when the stakes are, are so incredibly high and, and, you know, how far heroes will go to protect their loved ones. You know, it's a byproduct, a necessary byproduct of the sort of trope of the dual identity and, you know, trying to keep, you know, have the, have the hero job, but also have the family, not dissimilar to, let's say a police officer or military officer, um, except generally you don't have sort of villains going after your, your family. It doesn't happen quite as regularly, but those are really important questions. And, and here to have, you know, the three tent poles of the DC universe have those conversations outside the main book, I thought was really important. You know, I don't think there's a way for me to really bring it into my classroom in this, but may, you know, having reread it now, maybe I will this year. Maybe this is the first year where I take that snippet from these comics and add it into the discussion about identity crisis. If I do, I'll let you know. Yeah, that would be cool. So just as a quick side note, I know we talk about the lack of availability. How do you have these? Do you have the issues or you have the trades or... Uh, or did you no. utilize other means? That's okay. I utilized other means. Wink, wink. <laughs> look, we, look, we talked about this in the last episode. You yeah. know, when DC does not make these available, people only have so many recourses. So I, I hear you. I am I am generally not a fan of um, of pirating a any media. I, I, I'm a very staunch believer that the creators deserve everything that, that they should get from the consumption of their work. But again, when the corporate structure doesn't make them available, I, you know, I think us talking about it, I, I would hope makes up for the loss of revenue from actually buying it because it will inspire, as you said, many of your listeners, hopefully to, you know, maybe go to eBay and pick up the individual issues or maybe track down a used copy of the trades or even see if maybe their local library has it. Um, so, you know, to, to raise the awareness of the stories, even if they're not readily available, hopefully, you know, undoes some of the damage of, of having to pirate them. Yes. I think you can sleep soundly tonight, Scott. It's, it's all right. Mm. And well, you know, it's funny as someone, you know, as you know, the audience knows, I mean, aside from the podcast, but I've made documentary films and, and the most recent one, my comic shop country, you know, it's available to, to buy or to rent. And it's funny, like I've had people not with respect to my movie, but, you know, talk about, pirating other movies like oh i was able to get a copy of this and i'm like do you think i want to hear this like, do you, like <laughs> that's actually personally offensive to me as someone who makes anyway this is a quick side note uh one one actually a couple final infinite crisis pieces or identity crisis pieces mm -hmm. we do get this issue after sacrifice after superman's been mind controlled where he goes to zatanna right basically to try to say like hey is there any lingering effects of this I enjoyed the issue and this leads to the revelation because he said like this was it was really fascinating. He says to her, like, did you ever yeah. did you ever mind wipe or mess with the personalities of any of my villains? And she's like, Toy Man. Right. And of yeah. course that brings up all of the business with Adam Grant. And that's when she did it after and she says, like, after he killed that boy and you were so affected by it, like I tried to fix him. 
but of course it doesn't fix him. And I did really like the way this was set up, right? Where yes. Toy Man, Winslow shot, shot is like, he is in this fantasy world, right? Where he's helping all these kids and playing with them. It's a beautiful environment. Of course, they're actually in, in, in cages and, and, you know, he's just completely disconnected yeah. from, from reality. And then, you know, Zatanna makes him understand, right? And he, right. <laughs> you know, is, you know, can't even come to terms with the reality of, of what he's done. I enjoyed the issue, but going back to everything we've been saying about the real estate here, this is probably one we that that could have gone in favor of something that was more closely tied to the main arc. Like it's a great issue, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it really, you know, warranted the space at, at that deep into the run. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm sort of mixed because I also really liked that issue. Um, and part of it was also like, as we got into the later part of the run, I really liked Carl Kerschel on art. And, and so I was really enjoying the, the transition. Not that I didn't like Matthew Clark. It just, it was, a, it, they're very different styles. And Carl Kerschel just has a much cleaner style with not quite so many, uh, so, so many lines. Um, and I was really enjoying the smoothness of it. And so I was just, sort of in um i thought it was a nice extension of the discussion about when do you do this versus when you you know when you don't and and for zaytana who you know was the one who mind wiped dr light and you know ultimately batman to to have the conversation with superman and to make it personal for him right because dr light wasn't was never superman villain right so that's that situation superman not having been there for it not being part of the vote right this makes it uh, part of of you know part of superman's life um so i did like it and and like you said it, it was a really nice callback to one of the most horrendous things that any of his villains have ever done um you know to murder a child so i, I actually didn't it didn't pull me out as much as it seemed to have done for you i actually really liked uh, the issue. Yeah, no, I did enjoy it in, in and of yeah. itself. And it was kind of a thing at the time. I know there was uh, like the Will Pfeiffer Catwoman run at the time. Mm. I think Selena, you know, basically went to Zatanna and asked too, like, did you ever do this to me? Because, you know, she was starting to doubt whether, you know, because she had turned over a new leaf and she didn't know if that right. was, was her own or if that had been prompted by Zatanna. I forget the, what the resolution to that storyline <laughs> was. I feel like Zatanna had been, had tinkered around in there, I think. I don't remember. It's been a long time since I read that. But anyway, so it was kind of like in keeping with what was going on in, in the wider DCU at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the last major piece, I suppose, and we've talked about the fact that, you know, Lois is embedded overseas at <laughs> UMEC. Uh, unidentified right. Middle Eastern country. So essentially like a stand in for Iraq, right? There's, especially given the time period, I think that's probably absolutely what, what we were meant to think. But so, um, you know, the United States is, is, you know, in, in engaging in these military operations in this Middle Eastern country, she's embedded there and she is shot by a sniper. And it's, it's a really harrowing sequence at the end of of that issue where, you know, Superman's always got his ear out for her, right? And he hears it and he races across the world, right? And, he, you know, he's not there in time. Um, and he, you know, immediately brings her to the nearest, you know, medical um, outpost. And, you know, we see the DCU rally, not unlike an identity crisis where you really see the community, right? And they summon, you know, yeah. Dr. Midnight from the Justice Society <laughs> and he comes yep. and he performs surgery. They have Lois on the moon. And, you know, Clark, it's like, you know, he, he barely speaks you know, for that issue, he's, you know, he's, he's so torn up about it. And you really felt that. I mean, I really thought those, those were an effective couple of issues because it's the, it's the worst, you know, the worst nightmare. It's the thing that they fear every time she goes out and, and, and does these things. Yes. Yeah. And, and again, one of the reasons why I love Rucka's Lois is because he's not afraid to put her in really significant danger. And I don't mean, I don't mean the danger of like early Lois Lane where, you know, she's covering a story and sort of like falling off a building or, you know, the classic, you know, Margot Kidder with the helicopter, you know, from the original Superman movie. I mean, she is every bit as heroic as Superman, but just doesn't have his powers. And if this and this she felt that this was important because remember, when they first sent her over there, they sort of tricked her. And she ended up with a, like a unit that was never going to see any real action or combat. And she felt completely useless and sidelined by that. So she insinuated herself into 
a combat unit so that she could be there to report on what was actually worth reporting. Like it's an insult to her talents as a reporter to be placed there. I mean, for, with good reason, like nobody wants to see her get hurt for reporting on a story, but like sh- that's where she wants to be. And so I love how heroic Greg Rucka's Lois is. Uh, I love that, that if she had Superman's powers, she would be doing exactly what Superman is doing. Uh, and she just doesn't have his powers. And that's ultimately why I think I think more and more the, the creators of Superman and Lois, the TV show, had to have taken some inspiration, at least a little bit, from Rucka's Lois. Because, look, they made a very conscious decision to call that show Superman and Lois. Not Lois and Clark, which we know is like a romantic comedy. Superman and Lois. They get equal billing in that title and the show does a great job as well of pushing Lois to the front and making her every bit as intrepid and brave and, and as, as Superman is. And I love that dynamic. I love it. I, I, I never, ever, ever want to see Lois as the damsel in distress ever again, because it's just not who she is. And this story didn't make her that. Yes, she was in distress, but she was in distress because she's a hero. And sometimes the heroes are, are, are injured. Absolutely. I mean, she does what she can to the extent of, of the abilities that she has, just like Superman, right? So they're very much on the same page. And there's a great moment where uh, she and her fellow reporter and the soldiers, they're with her, they're on, taking on gunfire. And, you know, when one of the soldiers is, is down and is exposed and, you know, she runs out to try to help him. And the mm-hmm. other reporter is like, wait a minute, like what, you know, you could get hit. Like, what would I tell Clark? And she's like, he'd understand, yeah, you know, which was such a, a great moment. Uh, so yeah, you really feel you you really feel for Clark in those moments where where she shot. What what it did call to mind was the opening sequence of Batman v Superman, right? Because this whole idea of Lois being in this you know you know international uh, situation and the ramifications of Superman's involvement, right? So. Of course, and that's the other thing. And I was thinking about this because Clark makes the point to her. He's like, I can't be there, yeah. right? And the idea is, you know, any action that he would take there, his very presence would be construed as acting on behalf of the, you know, the United States government. This was something that came up in our last episode too. Right. And when he does land there to save her, the, uh, you know, the, the, the rebels end up surrendering like within an hour. And what we find out later is that this was all orchestrated. It wasn't a sniper from from that specific country. This was all orchestrated by Maxwell Lord and Checkmate. And what I was saying yeah. before about these the, the Rucka's runs coming together, Lois goes to Diana, who sends her to this guy Jonah McCarthy, who had been a Checkmate agent, unbeknownst to her, but was part of Rucka's Wonder Woman run. And he right. sends her to the Checkmate headquarters and Sasha Bordeaux from Rucka's Detective Comics run. We find out she was actually the one who was behind the sniper rifle. Um, because Maxwell Lord knew that if Lois went down, Superman would show up and this conflict would be over. Yeah. So it was interesting to kind of see how all of that tied together. I was glad that there was at least, I mean, I don't know, on the one hand, you could say it's more, I mean, certainly more realistic and maybe more powerful if she were just shot as a result of what was going on in the situation that she was in. Um, but the fact that it was part of a larger picture, uh, I, I thought, you know, certainly worked fine. I guess the ethical question, though, that came to mind was, you know, you see how quickly they, you know, they, they surrender when Superman shows up. And so, you know, I understand his stance of, you know, I don't want to I don't want to insert myself in this way. But at the same time, if you know that doing so would bring an end to this, is it, you know, I don't know. Is it is it not is it not worse to sit out? What did you think? So we have to remember that this is still during a time when Superman's tagline is truth, justice in the American way. And he and, and so much of his conflict with President Lex Luthor was recognizing that at the end of the day, you know, he, he he's not going to openly defy, you know, the United States, you know, government. He has to be seen as sort of playing nice with. The president and the, and the government, and so to insert himself into 
any conflict that the United States has with any other nation means that he is seen as taking the United States aside, even if he isn't actually. Um, it wouldn't be for another couple of years where we got that wonderful uh, backup story in Action Comics 900, where Superman declares himself not a citizen of America, but a citizen of the world. And he makes a very public global statement about it, that I am a citizen of the world. And when I act, I am acting on my own behalf and on behalf of no other entity or nation in the world. And then fast forward to just, I think, last year when DC Comics decided to actually alter the tagline a little bit. So he's now uh, truth, justice, and a better tomorrow and a better tomorrow, which again has more sort of global and you know universal implications. So yeah, I understand that if he still you know, stands for the American way, he really can't be seen as interfering with that because it just messes up global politics. Now I think the, his actions would be very, very different because he only acts on his own behalf. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love these ideas and these questions that, that this, that this brought up. So as we close in on the two hour mark here, I think we've, I think we've done a thorough job of unpacking this run. I'll say my concluding thoughts here are just that I really enjoyed it and I wish I had not sold it twice before. I'm glad that now I own it again. I don't plan on parting with these issues as with, the issues we talked about last time, I would love to see, I would love to see these added to the app. I would love to see these, you know, back in print in a new collection. I think it's a really worthwhile run. I think we've made a good case for it, even though, you know, there were things that uh, we might've found lacking, but overall, you know, when you look at Rucka's bibliography and especially his DC work, you know, this, this earns its place there. And I know, again, I know people go to detective. I know people go to wonder woman, rightfully so, but I hope that people will, you know, include, his adventures of Superman work in, in there as well. Uh, how about yourself? No, and, and it belongs in the, in the canon of, of Rucka's work here. Um, he's, he's, I think he's in this, he's really kind of still finding himself as, as a writer um, and knowing of course, where he ends up knowing, you know, what he becomes in in his superhero mainstream sort of corporate superhero work and for me especially in his creator own work um this is a writer who is so incredibly thoughtful and skilled that you know if, if you're not familiar with him you owe it to yourself to pick up something of his um doesn't matter what it is um lots of recommendations out there i'm not gonna take up time on here to to give them but you know this is rightfully so a writer who you know is at the fore of pushing com comics as a medium forward um and i and i appreciate him and i and i really enjoy his voice tremendously well said my friend thank you as always for joining me for this i really enjoyed it and you know, these past three episodes since our Thanksgiving break have formed a little mini arc thematically, at least. We looked at Camelot Falls and Black Ring. We looked at the Joe Casey run. We looked at this run. I think all, you know, you know, overlooked to some extent. And I'm glad that we were able to shine a light on them. And I, I've really enjoyed this swing of episodes, um, especially, especially these last couple where I really didn't know that I would cover these works because they were not as available. Um, but I'm glad that I did. And I hope people enjoyed. So thank you, Scott. I look forward to the next time that we can do this, which won't be too long from now. Um, and I know we gave some teases as to what that will be. Uh, audience, thank you as always for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Again, we're going to take our holiday break. We'll be back on January 10th. I hope you all have a safe, healthy, happy, restful, enjoyable holiday season. We will see you soon. And until then, as always, remember, it's about what you do. It's about action. Support the show and receive exclusive additional content, including my DC Movie Rewatch podcast at patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato. Thank you to all patrons for enabling me to produce this show. Also, be sure to explore the other shows within the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network, which is home to Digging for Kryptonite, another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman, Summoning the Zords, and My Comic Shop History, all hosted by yours truly. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Visit flatsquirrelproductions.com for more. Thank you all.